The Bird Emergency, the podcast. With this episode, I'm joined by a Queensland researcher working out of the University of Queensland, and it's Christopher McColl. But you prefer to be to go by Chris. You're you're doing a master's project at the moment on one of Australia's most interesting looking birds, a very a really an unknown bird. I don't think there's I don't think there's a lot of the usual birders in Australia will have seen it. So can you give us a brief rundown on the red goshawk and why you're so into it? Yeah, no worries, Grant. It's definitely a striking bird to look at, no no question. It's a large, medium to large sized raptor, reddy brown raptor. It's got a, it's grey underwing with some black terminal bands and just these huge yellow legs and feet and talons. So you are immediately captivated when you are fortunate enough to, to see one in the wild. But it's also, it's really an interesting case for a number of reasons. It's, it's really a unique species. It's an endemic Australian species. So for instance, the size difference between the larger female and the smaller male, that's common across most diurnal birds of prey. But that relative size difference in the red goshawk is one of the largest in the world of any bird of prey. She is almost two, two times his size, at least 75% based on the weights we've got from the tropics. It's taxonomically distinct. So its genus is Erythrotriorchis, and it shares that genus only with the one other species, and that's a, the chestnut-shouldered goshawk from the highlands of New Guinea, which reportedly is equally as rare and, and hard to find. And it's inherently uncommon. It, it's regarded as the rarest bird of prey in Australia. Even the first written account of the species in 1801 by Latham, even then described it as a, a scarce species. And that description has yeah, really withstood the test of time. They're very infrequently encountered, particularly in the southeast of their range. To, to these days, to go and see a red goshawk, you, you've really got to go to northern Australia. Well, let's talk about their range because I, I checked it out on the site just before we were due to talk, and it's shown as being across the top end of Australia and extending down to the east of the Great Dividing Range, down into the southeast corner of Queensland. But there's a little spot in central Australia where it's shown as occurring. Now, is that... Do, do you believe that, that they're still occurring in somewhere around Alice Springs? No, that report is accurate. It was encountered by a well-known raptor researcher in Australia, in Australia called Tom Orman. He actually worked on what is the only really detailed study of the species in the 1980s up in the NT and Kimberley. He then moved down to Central Australia to do his PhD on raptor assemblages down there and sure enough encountered a red goshawk on a couple of occasions in the McDonald Ranges. And looking at their records over time, they are primarily coastal dwelling, but every now and then one of them will show up in these outlying locations in arid environments. So there's the records from Central Australia and recently last year the Pilbara region had its first red goshawk record ever, and it was 800 kilometres from the nearest, from the closest other record, which is around the Broome area in the Kimberley. And so, what we're now beginning to learn from our from tracking some of these birds is that they can cover vast distances, and they've got some pretty crazy seasonal movements. One adult female we tagged in the NT from Litchfield National Park. She went as far inland as the Tanami Desert this non-breeding season and has returned to Litchfield to, to now breed. So we're really just starting to reveal some of the, the mystery around these birds and their movements. So do you think it's possible that the extending further in their range and that they're just being unnoticed because they are such a um, secretive is not really the right word, but but then they're not a bird that you notice. They're not going to be soaring around in circles and it's just not a bird of prey that is going to draw your attention to it. So do, do you think it's likely that they're hanging out in other locations and that people who are not birdos just don't notice them? Well, it's probably a more traditional view that they 
are more like a typical goshawk that, that hides out and, and is in the, hidden in the vegetation. You don't see them out and about often. But we're finding, particularly for the larger females, they will use more open country than we first thought. They will soar also, particularly through the middle part of the day. It seems like they might perch hunt sort of morning and, and evening and then soar throughout the day just prospecting. But in terms of where they are distributed and how they are distributed, I, I think in some of those outlying locations, it's probably seasonal movements or dispersive juveniles. Or if they do occupy some of those areas, they would be at really low density and they'd, they'd have to be restricted to, to water courses, those small refuges of, of productivity. Their, their stronghold is definitely going to be in the more well-watered and forested parts of coastal regions of Australia would be my guess. Yep. So their preferred habitat is forest. When when we talk about forest in northern Australia, it's very different to what we would think of in the in in the moist the wet forests in the southeast. How dense is the vegetation in the areas that the goshawk prefers? So they require a certain level of openness, we believe. If you think of it's a large woodland raptor and it needs to navigate through those woodlands to hunt prey successfully. So if it's too dense, I, I, I don't think they would be able to use that type of thing, unless it's an ecotone, like you've got to change from, say, a thicker riparian vegetation structure in, leading into an open woodland. They might sit and hide in that and then wait for something to go on by and chase them down in the woodland. But that's it's actually one of the theories as to why they've possibly declined as much as they have in eastern Australia due to a lack of fire. And so through a lack of fire, the woodlands have, have thickened up, particularly that mid-storey, understory. And so whilst in some areas habitat loss has for sure played a role, but ha- changes to the existing habitat may, may also be exacerbating that problem. Now, you mentioned rainbow lorikeets, and they're really the torpedo of the, of the sky. Is that a main prey species? And are you aware of a broad range of prey? So they are almost exclusively a bird hunter, at least from what we know from detailed studies of of northern Australia. I think from memory, David Baker Gab and Tom Orman, they analysed 501 pellets and prey remains from birds in the NT and uh, Kimberley. And out of those 501 pellets and prey remains, there was only one mammal, some sort of flying fox. Everything else was other birds. And 50% of that was parrots. I believe out of that, it was one third rainbow lorikeets or red collared lorikeets up there. So I'm pretty sure it's going to be the smaller, more agile male that probably runs down those lorikeets. Because keep in mind, they're collecting those pellets during the breeding season. And from memory early on, there was a lot more, a high proportion of rainbow lorikeets. And then later on, as the breeding progressed and perhaps the female started to hunt a little more, they started finding more larger prey, such as black cockatoos. They can take sulfur crested cockatoos, water birds, things like that. But yeah, lorikeets of whatever variety are, are certainly a staple for them. So you mentioned that the male is probably catching most of the food. So so the male is presenting meals to the female in the earlier part and the mid part of the breeding season? Yeah, that's right. He's provisioning the female whilst she's on the nest to prize egg laying and once she has laid eggs and she's incubating and then when she's got young, vulnerable chicks, she's there guarding them. It's not till they're pretty well advanced and started to, to branch out of the nest bowl. They're called we call them branchlings. That's when she'll start heading off for little forays to do some hunting herself. But yeah, for a good four to five months it's it's the male who is provisioning the both the female and young exclusively. So in northern Australia we really talk about sort of having two seasons. When does the breeding occur in terms of the tropical seasons? Yeah, so they'll, they'll begin courtship typically, there's some variation, around May and and then start to build their nests more like June into July and then we see eggs laid typically July through August. You'll see those eggs hatch around September and then from then on you've got nestlings and they start heading out of the nest around November, December, but still dependent, still close to the nest site and, and being fed by the parents. And they don't really gain the semi-dependence until around 
almost the break of wet season, December, January, and they're they're hunting for themselves. And, and that's a part of what we do is we wait until they're, they're fully grown, fully developed, hunting for themselves, and we try and catch them and put a tracker on them just before they disperse to find their own territory. So we're getting that, that information on juvenile dispersal as well. Okay, well, that's a, a good point to talk about the genesis of the project. But I want to make sure that we do... Just remind me if I forget that we do get to the size of the territory, what and what's required for a, for a breeding pair. But let's talk about the the project because it's a collaborative project, and you're the University of Queensland part of it. But just explain how it came about and who the partners are. Yeah, so it's quite a story, really, and it's been going for a few years. I'd, I'd say as a background to this this project starting probably begins with my supervisor and, and colleague from the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, Dr. Richard Seaton. He was commissioned by the Queensland Department of Environment, a fella who we also work with named Dave Stewart, here in southeast Queensland to go and survey the red goshawk. It was a repeat survey of ones that they'd done in 95 and 2001 from memory. And basically that, those surveys concluded there was around 10 to 16 breeding pairs in southeast Queensland. Richard did his surveys in 2013-14 and didn't have a single observation of any red goshawk at all. And that was part of the trend they were starting to see, hence why the survey was commissioned. And those results have held true because there's not been a, a single other sighting since then. So it's been almost 10 years since someone's seen. So that sort of sent some shockwaves through the birding community. And David and Richard then started the National Red Goshawk Recovery Team. They brought in all the stakeholders from various government and non-government organisations. And they wrote a recovery plan. And they were then on the lookout for opportunities to partner with other organizations to, to get a research project up and running. So starting in 2015, I was up in WEPA, a land management and restoration office up there for Rio Tinto. It's a, a small bauxite mining town. And they had a, a mining operation approved a few years prior, and they had some conditions around how to manage red goshawk habitat. Even though red goshawks had, to that point, never been seen or no nests had been found, and there was a real knowledge gap on how to actually go and do that. So Rio Tinto Weepo were also keen to increase their knowledge base on the species. Through a mutual contract, contact Jason Searle, an ecologist who would come up and do work. He was based down here and in touch with the birding community here, and contact was made between both parties. An agreement was reached to, to share resources and publish the results. And so 2015, we, we headed on out. We, we found a nest and had some initial success in being able to catch and GPS track the, the first uh, set of red goshawk up there in Western Cape York. So the trackers, how big, how do you, how do you attach them? And then how, how do you monitor the results? So we use a solar GPS satellite transmitter. It is 17 grams, and we fit it to the road gossel through a harness. We make a harness, and it basically wears this tag like a little backpack on its back. And that harness is made of a smooth Teflon ribbon. We, we preed it into the bird, so it's not abrasive. And we required that technology. So it was only a, a fairly recent um, development that you could get that kind of technology in such a small tag. And that's what we required because we needed the data sent to us remotely via that satellite because we didn't know where they were going to go. They had, we knew they had huge home ranges. And so any option to relocate or recapture the red goshawk was going to be nigh impossible. So... Yes, that's the tag we went with. That's how we attach it. And through trial and error with various GPS fixed frequencies, and we've really refined our methods to the point that last year we were confident that we could kick off a, a full-blown PhD project. And, and I was fortunate enough to get that position to, to take that on as the student. So how many birds tagged now and when was the first bird tagged? The first bird tagged was in 2015, and so we just had that single nest. So that's you know, that's a key point, I guess, is that they are super hard to find. They occur at extremely low densities across even really intact landscapes like Cape York Peninsula. So we, we didn't really know if we'd have another opportunity. 
But fortunate enough, we, we found that nest. We were successful in catching the adult female. We then, a few months later, caught one of the two chicks that she had just before it took off. And so we really got, we were really off to a great start. And that's what we needed to give everyone that bit of confidence that what we had here was a, a viable project. We were still just calling it a pilot study at that point because we didn't know if we could, yeah, find nests, catch birds, et cetera, et cetera. We then did not catch another bird for the next three years. Despite repeated attempts, they have proven themselves to be in uh, Richard's view, who he's a raptor biologist and he's worked with birds of prey all over the world. He said they are by far the hardest bird of prey to catch that he's ever encountered. And so, but each time we pick up on something and we change something about our methods. And so we had a really a real breakthrough here in 2018. We had three nests. We went and trapped at those three nests and we caught three birds. So that was really the genesis for this project picking up. This last field season, which was my first as a student, we caught another three birds, including that one I mentioned in the NT. That was our first NT bird. And so now we're at a total of eight birds we caught and successfully tracked. Four of them are flying around right now, two, two adults and two juveniles. Is the, the tracking data available for the general public to to look at or is it closely held it's, it's held by us for, for the moment we the arrangements we have between rio tinto the australian wildlife conservancy University of queensland and the queensland department of environment the research and data share agreements are, are all in place so everyone gets copies and the, the intention is to publish those results just with you know this kind of study and this kind of species it just takes a long time it really does i mean once you've Let's, you know, once we've caught all the birds we want to catch, you're still looking at two to three years of just tracking. That's how long these tags can last. So it's by the end of it, we'll have some uh, amazing data and insights into the species. But for the moment, yeah, we're still very much in a data collection mode. And prior to the coronavirus, uh, we were planning that this would be our final year. But now we might have to continue this tracking study into next year. When a bird's caught, it's fitted with the harness. But are you? You're doing things like taking uh, a blood sample as well so that some genetic analysis can be done by perhaps a, a different team? We don't take a blood sample. We, we do collect a, a couple breast feathers for genetics down the track. That's not a core part of our project, but, you know, as you've got a bird in the hand, you should try and get such information. And then in terms of, like, measurements and morphology and things like that, if we catch the bird early enough and, and the harnessing goes really well and is, is efficient, we'll take those measurements. But the, the number one priority for us is to get that harness well fitted onto the bird and get it released. And the reason for that is because, you know, we're operating in the tropics and we're typically catching the adult female around sort of October. So it's in the middle of the build-up. It's really hot. And then we're catching the juveniles also in December, January, and it's, again, really humid and hot. So, yeah, our number one priority is just to get the birds released. So the life of the, of the tracker is about how long? The manufacturer says two to three years. The longest we've had one last was two years, was that first juvenile we caught. We caught her in January of 2016, and then the tracker eventually died in January bit like our internet connection there just about died. Chris, so can you just tell us again when the tracker failed? Yeah, so the bird that we've tracked the longest so far was two years, almost to the day. It ran from January of 2016 through to January of 2018. That was the first ever juvenile we call it. And currently we have a bird flying around, an adult female who resides on the Dalhunty River of Western Cape York. She's been tracking for 18 months and still going strong. So we might get three years out of it, hopefully. When the tracker stops feeding back information, does the harness just remain on the bird forever or will that degrade and fall off as well? Yeah, so we sew a cotton weak link into the harness where it crosses over the bird on its breast. And so it's intended that eventually that will um, degrade and fall off or it would break under pressure if, say, a bird happened to be caught snagged on a stick or something like that. Okay. Okay. That's that's good to know. Now, what's the process of when the when you've done your academic work with the, the data, how is that data feeding into habitat protection or, or modification or re-establishment of revegetation and whatnot of mine sites because it's over the range is over such a large area. You've got 
two states and one territory within the range, but only one government being involved in the in this project. Is your work currently informing habitat managers outside of Queensland? We're definitely contributing what we can based on you know, the data and knowledge we have at present. For instance, Stephen Garnett is going to be releasing his action plan of Australian Birds 2020 edition soon. And so myself and some of my colleagues are helping him write that chapter based on some of these initial tracking results. But the, yeah, I should mention that the geographical scope of this project isn't confined to, to Cape York. We've always taken a whole of species approach and we are actively trying to find birds and, and study birds from Cape York Peninsula right across to the Kimberley and I've even been in talks with um, the guys on Tiwi Islands which is a stronghold for the species. So we're really hoping to get very broad holistic findings on home range, habitat usage, resources that they require at a landscape level so that we can really inform conservation management at a scale appropriate to really benefiting the what appears to be the remaining population of the species, which is restricted to northern Australia. What's the most surprising thing that you've discovered about the goshawks in, in your time of tracking them? Yeah, it would have to be the scale of these seasonal movements. I mean, the literature prior to our work said that northern Australian birds would be year-round residents, and yet the first bird that we tracked through multiple breeding seasons, she started heading south from north of Weeper and just kept going. We were just, everyone, every three days, we get the data sent via satellite and I'd be downloading it and everyone in the office would just be waiting to see where she was and where she might stop. And she ended up, she spends her uh, non-breeding season as far south as near like Richmond and Hewenden in the sort of border between the Gulf Plains and Ainsley Uplands, which is a really like poorly understood area for the species. And so we now know that it can support them at least seasonally. But yeah, just the scale of their movements and the size of their home ranges, I would say, has really impressed me. What's the size of the home ranges that you're seeing in the birds that you've managed to to capture and track? You'd have to, I guess, break it up into breeding season and non-breeding season home ranges. The unfortunate thing at present is we haven't been successful in catching a male. And so he's obviously the one doing all the flying around and hunting during the key parts, the critical parts of the breeding season. So that's something we're, we're hoping to do. But even the females, once they start moving around, you're talking a home range in hundreds of square kilometres for, for just one bird. Now, I haven't asked the, the obvious question, really, that you, you're capturing birds. Is that mist netting that you're doing to capture them? It's... Not mist netting. We use um, what's called a, a bow net. It's a, a spring loaded thing. And so you need to be, we set up a, a really good hide, uh, a bird hide, or it comes from the States actually. It's what the, the hunters use over there. It's called a hunting blind. We cover it with vegetation and it's basically like a military operation. We have to go in in the cover of darkness, like 3, 4 a.m., crawl into this hide, set the trap, and then wait for sunrise and Hopefully, we can entice the red goshawk down into the trap and you are sitting there in your hide and you activate the trap and then we, we go running out and secure the bird and then quickly get it to the processing station to start the harness attachment. So give us an idea of the success rate of the number of times that you would uh, activate the, the trapping device. How often are you successful? Oh, yeah, virtually 100%. You've really got to be precise. We've bought an oversized bonnet, so it's a spring-loaded contraption, and so there is that. We have to be conscious of that risk to the bird if it was to suddenly try and take flight or something like that. But, yeah, basically, once it gets in the zone of this, what is a 16-foot bonnet, it's as good as trapped. If you're getting a 100% right when they're in the zone, I'm guessing that might only be once a day. Oh, if that, yeah. So <laughs> there's a lot of days and a lot of mornings where you're just sat there and fighting off mosquitoes and the heat and, yeah, there's no no action from the red goshawk there. They're just super wary. And that's what I was hinting at, that we had those multiple years of failed trapping attempts. It's just we had to tweak things and go to the next level each time. And so that's why it's like we're out there at 3, 4 in the morning. We're setting our traps days and days before we actually plan on 
using them or activating them just so the red gold salt gets used to the setting of it yeah it's become like a, a really strict protocol to get and a whole lot of effort to get one red gold salt and that's why i said that you know this has just taken so many years to, to even get to this point but pretty well at a point now where we're confident that we can catch the adult female we're confident we can catch juveniles but the male he eludes us and that is quite possibly because he's just not there as much. We don't have that same contact time because he's off hunting, but also because he is a lot smaller, I'm pretty sure he's a whole lot warier too and probably not willing to go to ground as much. We still have to figure out how to catch that. With the the tracking and the data that you are getting there is irrefutable, concrete data. What are your observations like that when you're out in in the field? Are you seeing females more than you are seeing males do they have vastly different habits just from what you're able to see so to be honest i don't get to spend as much time as i'd like to just doing that sort of observational stuff at least i haven't to date because the, the focus has really been on we try and practice absolute minimum disturbance around the nest and the, the goal is to, to catch the bird and put the tracker on and let the tracker do the monitoring for us and and i should mention where we're also, but that said, we are monitoring currently 12 nests from as far as the Kimberley right across to Cape York. So trying to keep track of their breeding and nest productivity and if those territories are occupied year to year. But I, I am planning for the next couple of years to try and put in more time just to observe them so that it will hopefully help me understand better the patterns that I'm seeing in the tracking data to help try and explain what's going on with them. Are you confident that the work that you're doing now will be continued beyond your involvement, that that it will be an ongoing project? I mean, it's hard to say. And it this project began in 2015, really. So we're already five years in. And the term of my PhD project, once I go up, is, is another five years. So we're talking of 10 years to try and figure these guys out. And that's, that. to be honest, that's what's required to, to understand this species. It's super difficult to study. But I'd be lying if I said that in the back of our minds, particularly Richard and myself, there wasn't a bit of a dream to, based on the sort of habitat modelling we'll eventually do to see if places like southeast Queensland or northern New South Wales, where we believe they're extinct now, is still viable to support them. And if you can understand what the threats are, if we can manage those threats, then if reintroduction of the species would ever be possible, then that is something that we'd be thrilled to to play a role in. So they're an apex predator in the areas where they are located. Do, are they an indicator species being an apex predator? for the health of an ecosystem? Yeah, most certainly. So they are known to require vast tracts of intact habitat and they are known to use some of the most biologically rich places within their distribution. They're an apex predator. They only hunt live prey. They do not scavenge. They do not pirate off other birds. So they require a really healthy ecosystem to provide them with the, the prey base that they need, to particularly to support their breeding. So birds of prey worldwide are often known as that sort of canaries in the coal mine. But with the red goshawk, yeah, being that true apex predator, live prey specialist, it, it would most certainly be an important bioindicator of wider ecosystem health. I'm guessing there's no hard and fast data to support this, but have you got a sense of what their main competitor in their natural habitat is? I would guess they compete with the other bird eaters, particularly the other goshawks, sparrowhawks, also arguably little eagle. I do recall reading that there is like a partitioning of the prey that they each species targets based on the size of that prey. And so the red goshawk looks more into the medium to large size prey, honey eaters up to cockatoos, whereas the goshawks and sparrowhawks are probably catching slightly smaller prey. And I believe the little eagle was a specialist in, in large prey only. So there is a prey partitioning there in terms of competition. Okay. So that's hopeful in terms of their reintroduction, that the competition pressure is perhaps not as great as it might be imagined. And certainly if what's happening down here, way down south, there's certainly no problem with getting a rainbow lorikeets for Tucker. Yeah, well, it's all kind of part of the mystery that they've disappeared from these regions and yet brown hawk goshawks, 
Greg Oslox, they're, they're all doing fine. They're also a bird eater. So there's got to be something more to it. It, it could relate to their size. They're, they're the largest of the goshawks by far. And the size difference between them, the male and female may have totally different requirements in terms of prey and habitat structure. Like, like we discussed earlier, the, the females have been using a lot more open country and they were recorded here in the Lockyer Valley just outside Brisbane, often hunting along dams and, and watercourses for, for waterfowl. So, yeah, I still think there's quite a bit to be learnt about this species and trying to explain what's happened to them along the East Coast. And hopefully we can gain that knowledge by studying birds from Northern Australia where they remain. You're obviously following the the recorded sightings of red goshawks through the sites that are up and active. From your observations of other people's observations, is it the female that is observed more often than the male? It's hard to say. They are quite easily misidentified. The square tail kite is the, the classic one. They have virtually the same plumage. And then you've got juvenile swamp harriers, also possibly juvenile black-breasted buzzards, spotted harriers, they can all look similar. So to, to correctly identify them, let alone identify the, the gender or age, is yeah, often problematic to know. So you'd be suspicious of a lot of the casual records of red goshawk that are, that are outside of the, the tropical belt that, that you know that they are breeding in? Absolutely, yeah. So the research I've done so far, it's just not looking good for them all up the east coast until you really until you get to Cape York. The the sightings are few and far between, particularly in the last decade, there's been a, a drastic decline. And so each one of those dots on the map I'm thoroughly investigating and I really hope some of them prove to be to be accurate and to be genuine. But any records in those areas, you you're really gonna need ideally a photograph or some good birders who've seen the species before, things like that. And we'll go through and try and look at them objectively and use some set criteria based on the circumstantial evidence and, and see what that spits out once, once we analyse it for patterns in their distribution and abundance. And that'll be all part of um, the first paper we release, which will be a thorough review of their current population status and how that relates to their conservation prioritisation. Where, where will you publish that first paper, Chris? Probably in an Australian journal, an Australian ornithological journal, something like EMU, I guess. We, we haven't discussed strategically where we would do that, but you know, we, we just want to get it out there, really. It's, it's not about going after a prized journal or anything like that. It's just getting the information out there. Great. Well, let's talk more generally about you, Chris. Where, where did your sort of interest in birds begin? So I'm a relative latecomer, to be honest. I can tell you exactly when I started actively bird watching it was july 2014 i know that because i recently tried to get in touch with the Mackay bird watchers group that i used to go out with to to talk about yeah red goshawk records i'm actively chasing bird groups all around the place and looking through my old correspondence that was the first outing i went on but you know i've always been environmentally minded i'd call myself more of a, a naturalist as a kid just interested in everything and fascinated by documentaries david attenborough steve and all that stuff but really i'd always imagined myself as being like a park ranger or something like that and opening elliot traps with furry little mammals scurrying away I, I wasn't really fully into birds it's just where my work has taken me and I've done research on the red goshawk. I've done research on the palm cockatoo and a couple others. And yeah, I am I'm 100% a bird nerd now, and particularly for birds of prey. So was it the red goshawk that that sort of opened the door for you? You walked into the bird nerd hotel as a result of the red goshawk, or was it, for instance, the palm cockatoo is a pretty fascinating beast? No, it definitely accelerated my bird nerdery once I started working with those species. And I was living on Cape York. It was really formative years for me up there. But I had started bird watching prior to that around uh, the Mackay region. And I used to go out west and see things like you know, squatter pigeons and black cockatoos and just loved it. But yeah, the, the stakes were, were definitely up once I lived in a, moved to Cape York and started working with those species. So did the move to Cape York for you... Was that necessary because of your research or you mentioned you were working with one of the mines? Is that what drew you to Cape York, the, the employment, or were you following birds? 
Yeah, it was the employment. So I wanted to take up an opportunity to start specializing in more like land management and, and restoration type work. And as soon as I got there, it feels like the threatened species research and management things side of things really started to pick up. For instance, the first month I was there, we were commissioning a tree climber to to head on up and install some nest cameras on the, the red goshawk nest. And it really just caught me and it's just really gone from there. So it's probably a, a question that doesn't need to be asked because I'm thinking that the answer is red goshawk. But do you have a favourite bird? Yeah, it definitely is the red goshawk. Like it, it has to be. But a close, a very close second would have to be the palm cockatoo, as we've discussed. Those guys are amazing. And to see them in the bush, it's really good. It's They're just a dinosaur flying around and the, the repertoire they've got and you start to get your ear for it and you can fly you travel around to different regions in Cape York and you can detect differences their drumming their slow slow rate of breeding they just they just captivate you but definitely number one is the red gossel so where's your favorite location for going bird watching as, as a relaxation rather than as work well, it's one of the same for me. So I'm based in a town called Toowoomba, which is about an hour and a half inland of Brisbane. We're up on the Great Dividing Range. And historically, Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley was the sort of stronghold for red goshawks. And so I still you know, catch up with old time birders and they talk about their encounters with, with red goshawks. And so these days, I'm more than happy to visit those old spots and carry my telephoto lens with me just on the off chance that one might fly by. It's really cool too because we are up on the range. We've got that topography that you can get yourself out on a real vantage point and, and do what's like a traditional hawk watch that they do overseas with the migrations they have in Europe and North America. So lately I've been doing quite a bit of that and just fingers crossed that also happens to fly by. But of course I get to see all sorts of birds of prey at the same time. So when you're out doing a, a hawk watch, sitting on the on, on a spur or a ridge, What's the field guide that you've got with you? So for general birding, I'm just, I'm using my app, my Pizzy and Night app on my phone. It's just too convenient not to use, to be honest with you. But for birds of prey, it'd have to be the photographic field guide that came out just last year, I believe. That's my friend Richard and Steve Davis and Matt Gilfeder released. And that that is a really really valuable resource it's photographs the birds of prey from all different angles and so it's you're able to better match what you're seeing with the field guide so i've found that for identifying birds of prey to be a really useful resource so are you a bird watcher who likes to take pictures and just enjoy what's in front of you or are you a ticker and flicker no, definitely for the enjoyment. These days, yeah, like I said, I'm always carrying my camera just in case I see something that I'm not sure about or just to improve my general birding if there's a species I can't identify. But particularly, I'm a lot better with the birds of prey and I'm just, I'm going for my binos and just enjoying watching their movements and um, yeah, trying to get a better understanding of them. Okay, so, so when you're talking to birders, there's always the best get. So let's take the, the red goshawk out of the picture. What's your best get on your casual bird watching trips? Oh, that's easy. It was only last year whilst I was doing that work in Litchfield, I saw Oriental honey buzzard. It was only the, the second time, like there was a cluster of sightings. I wasn't the second person to see it. I knew it was in the area, but it was only the second time that they'd had one in the NT. And I just saw this thing with way up high soaring, but the, the huge paddleboard wings that was like, nothing else it could be got the binders on it saw the, the banding and everything and sure enough it was oriental honey buzzard so that's been my best find oh, good so and that's an accepted sighting nobody's shot you down on that one no i was with another fella he he backed me up and there was a sighting prior to me seeing that bird and there was a couple after so i'm, I'm pretty confident okay so so that's your best get what's number one on your hit list what do you want to get out there and see it was Black Falcon, but I went and saw those guys on Wednesday, saw a pair of them. They're, they're an impressive bird. So now I'm, I'm really just trying to close out all of the Australian raptors. So I'm due to go to the desert country and see Grey Falcon. And So you haven't copped a Grey Falcon yet? I have not, no. But it's crazy to think that that's that adult female red goshawk we've tracked down into the Tanami that they'd be, she'd be for sure overlapping with grey falcons. So you always just imagine yourself out there in the desert birding and in one day seeing a red goshawk and grey falcon. Many years ago, I was on my own and I was changing a tyre 
on my then Land Rover at Jambon in central Queensland and a grey falcon sitting here in a dead branch about 50 metres away. And Wow, that's a good one for CQ. Yeah, well, I didn't believe it for never i didn't believe it didn't re- record it but w- when you see them they, it, it can't really be anything else so yeah i think that's probably my that's probably my best get but i don't go out bragging about it because no one was with me but <laughs> they can't really they can't really be anything else and they're surprisingly slender like the way they see it so yeah so that's uh, yeah well there's there's a fella who's just finished up his phd on the johnny Schoengen, uh a German chap, actually. And, yeah, he'd be a good one to talk to. He's also caught them and put trackers on them and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd love, to, well, I'd love to know what the extent of their range is. And it really leads me to my next sort of question for you, Chris. What's your gut feeling about how we're doing in preserving both birds and habitat? Are we losing, are we winning, or are we just treading water? I mean, if you were to look at the threatened species database the australian one the federal one there's definitely been more birds and and wildlife put on that list than taken off over time and so that would indicate to me that most species and most populations are declining and um, yeah so i'd say something's not working at present yeah well hopefully that uh, work like yours can tip the balance on at least some of the species i noticed that over the years the red gossel status has gone up and down so it's now rated as near threatened is that right isn't it no it's near threatened so it's a strange one it's classified near threatened by the iucn red list they assessed species populations on a a global scale wherever they are so they don't necessarily recognize country boundaries but the red goshawk is endemic so the global population is the australian population and yet our under our federal government listing they are vulnerable and then once you break it down to each state and territory that the species exists in it's it's a threatened species everywhere but it ranges from critically endangered and endangered in new south wales and queensland and then again vulnerable in the nt and wa so it's a difficult one to get a handle on isn't it because of the way it disperses outside of the the breeding season so hopefully your research will really inform that and the management decisions over the next few years. Now, I usually ask people, Chris, what they what they see for themselves in, in the next five years, where they see themselves in five years. Now, you, you see yourself doing pretty much the same thing over the next five years, yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm a year in some more years of this project. And so, yeah, I, I hope we have four key research objectives. I hope to deliver on those and graduate with a PhD. That's my goal. And then we'll see what happens from there because no doubt we're going to reveal and create more questions that need answering. And so there should be further research, whether that's for me or someone else, some new blood to come in and do, I don't know. But following that, yeah, Richard and myself, we, we're thinking of uh, a little pet project on black falcons. They seem to be really poorly known. So that could be our Raptor Research Project 2.0. Yeah. Now, I think we've covered the four main objectives of your project, and that was to review and quantify the red goshawk population trends and geographic range. I think we've talked about that. Determine the home range and their environmental utilisation distributions, a broad-scale survey. We probably haven't talked really about the extent of the range in, in detail, and that's really because the known range is not really known, is it? It's a really depopulated area of the country where it possibly is frequenting. Yeah, possibly. So in terms of their geographic range, my best guess is that the species at present is probably extinct in New South Wales, probably extinct in southeast Queensland. There is a big question mark between southeast Queensland until you get up to Cape York Peninsula. So the coastal Queensland. There's just so little data. But in terms of looking at the numbers and the patterns that we're seeing in the reported sightings over time, it appears there's definitely been a decline there. So it's quite possible they're extinct from there too. Northern Australia is definitely their remaining stronghold. But then that is exacerbated by these seemingly random occurrences we have of birds popping up in strange places, these seemingly strange places to us, such as the McDonald Ranges and the Pilbara. I 
personally, I believe they're just birds that are moving seasonally or juveniles that perhaps have dispersed to those areas. I, I think the core breeding range that they need to sustain themselves is more so coastal northern Australia where you've got more water resources, taller timber, rich in prey. If they are in the more inland areas, it'd be at very low densities and it'd be restricted to watercourses would be my my guess. Chris, is there much Indigenous knowledge of the species that you've been able to draw on? No, not yet, to be honest. I, I say yes, because I am hoping to go to the Tiwi Islands. And so you've got a limited landmass, Bathurst and Melville Island, just off the coast of Darwin. And on that landmass, there is supposedly 100 breeding pairs of red goshawks. It's just far surpasses any density seen anywhere else. It's a stronghold for the species. There's not a lot of other raptors. Like it's a bit unique. They must it must have been isolated through deep time because you've got subspecies there of masked owl and a robin and various things. And so I imagine the TOs there have a much closer affinity with the red goshawk than perhaps other traditional owner groups have because they're just so sparsely populated and over large areas. So I am really keen to to get over there and, and speak with some senior traditional owners and, and get their views on, on the red goshawk and what it means to their culture. I think that'd be super interesting. No doubt. Perhaps a little bit surprising that m- maybe there's not some traditional knowledge that, that, that you would be aware of on the Western Cape. But I guess that's one of the sort of anomalies of the history and the relationships of settlement in Australia that we haven't sought and we haven't valued any of the knowledge that is there and it's probably rapidly decreasing, which is you know what one of the great shames of the country, I think. But there's my political, there's my political statement for the day, Chris. Chris, have you got any long term goals in your sort of ecological work? Really, like I mentioned, I was a late starter to, to bird watching. I was also a late starter to the field of environmental science. I didn't go to university to study that till I was 23, graduated when I was 25. So I feel like I'm playing catch up a little bit. But I, yeah, if I can do a good job on this project and, and get my PhD and then become a fully ticketed member of the, the scientific research community that I'd be thrilled with that and then yeah like I said I've got a, an affinity with birds of prey there's actually a somewhat of a, a dearth of, of knowledge in this country with raptor research particularly like hands-on raptor research if you compare it to countries like North America and Europe where they have like dedicated field stations to just catching and measuring and processing birds of prey we, we really don't have that we don't have migration. So I think that's a, a definitely an, an area we're lacking in. And so, yeah, if I can acquire some skills and then pass those skills on, that'd be great. I'm also involved in the BirdLife Australia Raptor Group, whose sole mission is the research and conservation of birds of prey. So I'm just going to yeah try and be involved and, and do what I can. Well, I reckon if you're working with the red goshawk and having success on a project with such a difficult bird to to locate and to know, I think you're going to be well well and truly welcomed into the bird nerd fraternity, Chris, and I'm pretty sure that the work you're doing is, is going to be uh, really valuable information for anyone who's following in, in your footsteps, um, managing the species in the future, and I'm wrapped that you agreed to share with us on the bird emergency. Thanks very no, much. Th- thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. It's been great, Chris, and I really look forward to following what or where the project leads us. I think it'll be fascinating, and I hope we'll be able to talk again.